Hello? Am I audible? Yep. All right. So the topic is perfecting the cloud recipe for an enterprise. So this topic is pretty fresh. Just over the weekend, we had implemented on our website for our retail investors, which pretty much leverages on our cloud front S3 and Lambda Edge. And so far, the response is pretty cool. You know, uh, this is perhaps a win-win solution to both the customers as well as SGX. So for our customers, it will improve the usability a lot. Whereas for SGX, we can pretty much implement a, such a global solution with literally a, lick, you know, a very little effort. So now let's get this started. Uh, so a little about me, I'm Badri. I lead the digital infrastructure. I'm working in a Singapore stock exchange. And more importantly, I live on Love Cloud. Here's the agenda for tonight. So uh, we'll begin with the motivation, and what, what a motivated us to go, a go so like such solution. And we'll have a quick go through on the AWS services, what we have leveraged on. And uh, I'll run through with the solution, uh, which is pretty much a hybrid cloud implementation. I believe most of you comes from an enterprise. You know, we will end up in having such solutions. Uh, I, you can pretty much relate to it. And I'll, 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 I'll explain you some of the design considerations, what we had done in implementing the solution. And then some of the operation considerations, which is very important as well, like a disaster recovery and how do you manage deployments when there is no CI/CD. And uh, uh, looking forward, uh, what I'm expecting in this S3 Lambda Edge and uh, you know, Cloud Trend, we'll conclude other questions. In a way, uh, the motivation uh, the motivation is very typical to uh, very typical, I would say. Like uh, we come from a traditional web server environment where we host all of our single page applications and. Uh, there's an internet bandwidth constraints as well. Like, uh, so we have a hard limit of 100 megabytes. That's where we can scale. So this internet bandwidth considerations always, uh, you know, also limits us to scale the number of concurrent users. So let's assume, for example, right. So we have 100 megabytes of internet bandwidth, and in a typical no good cat scenario, you can only scale up to 100 u concurrent users, which is, you know, it's just not the scale what we expect itself. And then uh, obviously we don't have any content content delivery network. So this all, this all made us uh, you know, uh, go with a natural choice. As an enterprise, we leverage on uh, AWS public cloud as such for our implementations. And uh, so we, uh, this, this, this introduces the natural choice with the AWS Lambda Edge, CloudFront, and uh, you know, S3 in a pure serverless way in hosting our single page applications. Cool. So let's, let's quickly go through on the AWS services, what is involved in this, uh, you know, in this implementation itself. Holistically, there are two services, which are uh, primarily two services, which are involved in this implementation, which is CloudFront and S3. CloudFront is basically a uh, content delivery network, which you all, are, uh, which you all heard of. This content delivery network is basically an, uh, a globally distributed network of proxy service, which catches your content and accelerates your content delivery. What was interesting to me upon looking at the CloudFront, uh, you know, CloudFront way of engineering is, so, uh, uh, you know, they also optimize as your TCP round trip. So in all good scenario, uh, this CloudFront, it reduces the TCP round trip time by, you know, one RTT, which is very significant. And uh, so these are some of the subservices like Lambda Edge, WAF, Shield, ACM. So these are some of the services which you implement separately and you integrate with the CloudFront to provide some comprehensive solution. So Lambda Edge, which lets you run the code in the edge locations. So if you, if you think about it, right, so this Lambda Edge, which lets you run the containers in all the pop locations. And if you look at the number of pop locations, what we have in globally for in AWS, it's quite a lot. And that, that sort of scale it provides with the Lambda Edge. And WAF, it's a uh, layer seven firewall. Uh, sealed, uh, uh, sealed is something which you don't implement separately, but it is something which is baked inside the cloud front, and it guards you against the layer three and layer four DDoS attacks. And ACM, this is the place where you upload your customer social certificate, which is pretty much the case with all the enterprise itself. So, and with, uh, we, together with all the services, you integrate with the CloudFront, which provides the comprehensive solution. Uh, and then the origin, for us the origin, uh, it's we pretty much leverage on S3, which is our storage, uh, you know, uh, where we store all the front-end assets. And KMS, we are pretty much for uh, data encryption at rest. So whatever the logs we deposit, uh, we, uh, we come from financial services where we're very sensitive to any data at rest. So this KMS, which, uh, which we manage our keys to encrypt the data at rest, uh, you know, for the data we deposit in S3 itself. Cool. 
So let me run through, uh, quickly run through the solution. Uh, and I believe it pretty much can co correlate with the you know, solution against your enterprise itself. So there are two components, DNS and WAF, which are managed in the enterprise. Other than that, we are on the cloud front and S3, which is managed in the AWS public cloud. So DNS, we pretty much hosted on an on-premise, which runs in the traditional data center. And WAF, which is a managed service provider, it is a cloud-based provider, which purely does the WAF. So in it, uh, if you run through the solution, user issues the DNS query, let's say so-and-so, sgx.com, it resolves to the WAF IP, the WAF public IP address. This WAF public IP address, it, uh, it scrubs the request payload. It does all the layer 7 stuff, all the layer 7 scrubbing, and it forwards the request to the CloudFront path. So uh, before uh, forwarding the request to the CloudFront path, it resolves the distribution with the CloudFront path IP based on a lot of parameters like uh, the network congestion and the catch availability, the server capacity, you know, quite a lot of metrics to determine your CloudFront POP IP, and the, you know, and the WAF forwards the request to the POP. So once WAF determines the request for you know, the CloudFront POP IP itself, it forwards the request to the CloudFront, whereas the CloudFront, it, uh, it doesn't begin with serve the request. All it does is it does the SNI validation. How many of you are familiar with SNI validation? Right, so CloudFront, when you create a distribution, it carries its own SSL certificate for cloudfront.net. Yeah, so but then we enterprise, we come with a custom domain. So for us, it's sgx.com. So we also apply an SSL certificate for sgx.com, so on so dot sgx.com. So the, how the CloudFront dis differentiates which SSL certificate you present for the request which is coming in, all it does is it performs the host validation with the server header on the layer four, uh, and it presents the certificate back for you know the custom domain name what you're presenting itself. In this case, so on so dot sgx.com. And then CloudFront evaluates the WAF ACL rules, the access control, uh, access control list rules. This WAF, which evaluates the rule, which whitelists the public IP address, what it comes from, the you know, uh, what is managed in the enterprise itself. Once it whitelists, CloudFront evaluates the path pattern, what you're defining in. So each and each, every request, what, uh, what is getting triggered back to the CloudFront, it comes to the certain re relative path itself. So in a CloudFront, where you can define a behaviors and with respect, and you can tie the behavior with the respect to origin. In our case, it's S3. So it evaluates the path and forwards the request to the respect to you know, S3 origin itself. So uh, we, uh, S3, what it does is uh, we, uh, we store objects which are private, which we discuss about, you know, uh, um, which we discuss about, we discuss it later. So this S3, it evaluates the bucket policy and it, uh, it authenticates the request which is coming in from the CloudFront, and it presents back the object. So when S3 presents back the object, we don't directly present back to the uh, user. We invoke Lambda at Edge on the origin response. So upon, upon receiving an origin response from S3, this S3, uh, um, this S3 response gets decorated by the Lambda Edge, and this uh, response is decorated and presents back to the CloudFront catch. And then CloudFront, it retries the cache response and present back to the user. Right, now let's go through the design considerations, right? So uh, we are pretty sure that we are gonna use this S3 for storing our single page, you know, front-end assets itself. Now, now there, there comes a differentiation like whether we use S3 origin or S3 website. S3 website is typically, in a, you can treat like a web server, right? So S3 website is more of like, you know, it's the HTTP integration to your cloud front itself. Whereas S3 origin, it's more of like a REST API endpoint, which, uh, 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 which, which formulates the standard according to the AWS uh, S3 uh, RESTful standards, and it triggers the request itself. So we had quite a lot of factors which we had evaluated at the time of selection, uh, selecting which to go with. And these are some of the four significant factors which, uh, you know, which, we, uh, which, des uh, uh, which decide, uh, decide our solution itself which is pretty much an access control. With S3 origin, you can host both the public and the private objects. There's a website, it only supports the public objects. Customer response, with S3 origin, it returns back an XML formatted response, whereas S3 website is more of like an, uh, the web server kind of utility. For any customer response code, like say 404, HTTP 404, or HTTP 500, it presents back the index in the presence back the HTML page what you pre or what you what you predefine in the, each of the response code itself, and then the redirection support S3 origin obviously it's more of like a HTTP endpoint it doesn't it's not applicable, and S3 websites it supports both ob uh, object and the bucket level redirects, 
SSL support, yes, S3 Origin comes with the, uh, it supports the SSL connection, whereas the website doesn't support SSL, it's only so through HTTP. So if you look at the difference, right, the key difference is between the security and the usability. What do you think we have selected? Origin. Yeah, exactly. Security eats the strategy for breakfast, right? So we had to go with the S3 Origin. So on S3 Origin, there are two things which you tie with the uh, which you create, uh, which you which you consider in S3 origin itself. One is the origin access identity, another one is the data at rest. Origin access identity is typically in a you, know, you treat that like a special user, yeah. So you create the special user and you try that to the CloudFront origin. So here in this case, we create this user and we associate that with the CloudFront origin. When the request gets initiated from the CloudFront origin and it presents it back to S3, it authenticates the request with the identity what you indicate itself. And then S3 evaluates against the bucket policy and it ensures this origin access identity is authorized to read the object itself. So there are a few pointers to consider. So create, create the, uh, don't, uh, don't, reuse the ob uh, don't reuse the origin access identity for different origins. Create a separate origin access identity and tie that with the each of the origins for your integration itself. If not, you're potentially reusing the same security bucket policies. Uh, you know, where this user will pretty much have access to a different origin where it is not supposed to. And then data at rest, yes, uh, we, we, CloudFront does capture all the access logs. We feel some, uh, you know, we are very sensitive, security sensitive organization where we make sure like, you know, all this data at rest, like uh, even the client IP address needs to be encrypted. So we don't use SS, uh, you know, S3 SSE, what it defaults come with. We create a customer managed key with a KMS, and they tie that back with the, uh, tie that back the objects for our data encryption at rest. Right, so there's something which you need to consider for the catch behaviors at all. So when, okay, so first, uh, avoid adding the catch headers. Avoid adding the catch headers in the origin, uh, you know, as much as possible. So what, uh, perhaps what I'm trying to say here is, you define your cache definitions at the CloudFront level and manage this cache responsibility at one place. Don't manage two places. So as long as you feel that individual objects in S3 needs a separate cache definitions, then it makes sense. You can add those cache headers in the S3 objects and it, uh, you know, um, and it can advise the CloudFront to respect to that, uh, the cache header definitions, what you define in the individual objects itself, which is typically not the case for most of the use cases. So as long as it is not needed, try, you know, uh, have this cache header definitions defined only in the CloudFront version, which is easy for you to manage itself. And compress the data, yeah. Compress the data to thin the data transfer to internet, and it, also it improves the page performance, right? So with CloudFront, so the, uh, you pay for the number of requests and you pay, for the, uh, the data, uh, you pay for the data transfer out to the internet. So before, the, before serving the response back to the internet, compress your response. Compress your response and present back, whereas the browser naturally has the ability to decode the ZSIP, uh, you know, compression to, uh, ZSIP compression in uh, you know, extracting your files itself. And one other consideration, so there's only one custom error response you can have in your CloudFront distribution. What does it mean is, so in a CloudFront distribution, you can have multiple origins. So let's say here in our case, we have two S3 buckets with the two different code bases. So these two, two different code bases carries a separate you know, custom error response uh, index pages, HTML pages, but irrespective of it, we are limited with uh, only one customer error response, what we can you know, implement in the CloudFront itself. So that introduces the necessity of having a Lambda at edge at the time when we present back a response, to make, uh, we evaluate the request pattern, and uh, if this request pattern matches so and so code bases, we present back the uh, origin response from the respect to S3 bucket accordingly. Right, so, and then WAF. So, uh, uh, on the WAF, what we basically do is, so we whitelist, we whitelist the, um, this, uh, the enterprise managed WAF public IP address, uh, to be only authenticated to be only authenticated to you know um, uh, re uh, receive the request from the CloudFront, and on top of it, we also make sure like you know we whitelist some of the synthetic monitoring public IP address. So this is pretty much needed you want for, for you to differentiate for you to isolate where the issue is coming from. In an event of any issues, you want to isolate whether it is from a WAF which is managed by an enterprise or it is from the CloudFront itself. 
So whitelist the IP, uh, that, uh, whitelist the IP where it's necessary for you to you know, troubleshoot the is issues as well. Uh, otherwise, proceed with the S plus or deny. So ACN. Um, ACN is the place where we upload our customer system certificate, and we tie that back to the CloudFront. And uh, there's one important thing, right? So uh, during this implementation, I had uh, uh, come across an article for CloudFront domain hijacking, which was pretty scary. So uh, always associate a C name with your CloudFront distribution. So just to give you a bit of context of what is this CloudFront domain hijacking itself, right? So when you create a CloudFront distribution, it comes with a unique distribution name. So this unique distribution name, which is pretty much a C name for your DNS. Yeah? So, uh, uh, but what CloudFront internally does is, when you initiate a request, CloudFront directly doesn't forward the request to the distribution. It evaluates whether the request host header matches the C name what you define in this CloudFront distribution. If it doesn't match, the request will fail. At the same time, if someone else have the CNAME defined, irrespective of whatever the distribution you map to this DNS, and if someone else have defined the CNAME with their own distribution, your request will forward to that distribution, which is very scary. Um, uh, uh, I, there is a recent development where they have tightened the security policies in uploading the you know, SSL identities, in, uh, in providing the authenticity to you know, uh, defining the CNAME into the CloudFront itself. Again, that is not comprehensive. So, this is something which is expected to, you know, uh, this is something which is open and is expected to fix. So always associate a C name with the CloudFront distribution, and when it's not needed, make sure you clean up your DNS. Yeah. Right. So Lambda Edge. So Lambda Edge is pretty much a necessity for us, right? Uh, there are a few things. So there is only so much uh, content headers, so much response headers you can define in S3 object. So uh, uh, when you present back a response, we expect some of the security headers, like uh, X-Frame options, XSS protection, content security policies, all the security headers which is not available in S3 right now. And you don't have any means in defining the uh, content headers other than to inject to the Lambda at edge itself. So we had to inject this Lambda at edge upon presenting the origin response from S3 to add all the security headers. And, uh, uh, you know, and to present back the response itself. And also one other thing, like uh, the, I'm not sure, they, uh, may, uh, you followed the announcement of S3 Select with the recent uh, reinvent. So this S3 Select, uh, it, pretty much, it pretty much improves the compute time in, res uh, in retrieving the response from the bucket itself. So it does pretty cool operations on the data at rest in S3, not on the network level. So uh, uh, whatever the queries you are executing, it pretty much execute on the data at rest, which solves a lot of computers in time, as well as it solves the data transfer time. All right, so cloud trial. So these are some of the operation considerations we had to do. So one is the cloud trial. Right, and now we have the service implemented. How do we monitor, like, uh, how do we monitor who is uploading the data into buckets, right? So we need to have a telemetry to uh, to see, like, you know, who is updating the content. We also, we, in a way that uh, this ensures the data integrity itself. So what we basically do is we integrate all the S3 write events along with the cloud trial. So we monitor, uh, the we monitor the events which are interest, which is basically a put object. So any object you write in S3, it triggers a put object call. So we monitor this event. It is, uh, you know, it is always coming up from the associated user. So what are the authorized user? If it is not from, uh, it is, if, if we feel something suspicious, it triggers an alert. So always, always integrate the cloud trial events uh, along with the S3 write, with minimally, so and monitor the monitor the monitor the suspicious you know, API calls in the cloud trial alarm itself. And then AWS CloudWatch. So CloudFront by default comes with a pretty cool dashboard, and uh, but that is not sufficient for you to uh, create an alarm itself. So you have to integrate, pretty much integrate whatever the default metrics which is available in the CloudFront with the CloudWatch. So the, there are a few things which you can uh, monitor is more of like, you know, uh, the error response codes and the surge in request. So do remember that you pay for the number of requests and the byte uh, which is transferred back to the internet. So if you feel anomaly in the surge in request, you can always trigger an alarm with the CloudWatch itself. And uh, yeah, Lambda. <coughs> so uh, uh, per, uh, perhaps for our, uh, you know, our production environment, we don't have a CD yet, we're in a progress in progress of implementation. So, but then I'm not a big fan of implementing an, uh, 
long term access keys and the uh, long term access keys, uh, you know, IAM access keys for the deployment itself. So how do you solve this problem, right? So we pretty much leverage on uh, Lambda. So this Lambda, all it does is it assumes the role which produces back the temporary security credentials, which is basically an access key, secret access key, and the session token. So this session token, all it validates for about one app, and then when you execute again, it rotates back. So with that key credentials, we integrate with our, uh, we integrate with our, we integrate with our deployment procedures to present back uh, to uh, for the for the deployment execution itself, and you assure that after one hour the keys expire. Right. So, as an enterprise, we always care about disaster recovery. So uh, here, disaster recovery, it's not about availability. It's about you know other other contingency events. For us, it's like more of like what happens if the account itself is compromised, right? So you pretty much need to have a procedure. It is very important for us to document whatever you have done. In this, uh, in this case, basically, whatever the cloud formation templates, what we have used to create this infrastructure. So uh, in, an event when, uh, in an event of any contingency, you pretty much follow this documentation and execute the CF template, which replicates the infrastructure itself. Cool. So this is something I'm looking forward. Um, how many of you are aware of Broadly? Oh yes, Steve, always. <laughs> so actually, uh, uh, Broadly is pretty cool. So uh, Broadly is an advanced compre compression standard. So uh, yeah, there are, uh, okay, uh, for for any typical web request, we pretty much follow a ZZIP. Whereas Broadly, it is an advanced compression. It is uh, pretty much like in a thirty percent ish efficient than ZZIP. So which means when you enable a Broadly. You reduce the data by an, uh, you know, another uh, 30 percentage, and you improve the page load performance, and also you improve the data transfer back to the internet, right? So there are a few challenges right now. Broadly is not supported across all the browsers, so that means you pretty much need to validate this request agents, user agents, and to present back the Broadly response accordingly. And uh, yeah, so Lambda to micro pages strategy. So. Um, we have a different code base now, and which is managed by a different uh, team of people itself. So going forward, what uh, what what I'm trying, to, what what we are trying to embrace is leveraging on the micro pages strategy itself. So with with the different code bases, you have a different uh, uh, different S3 origins and different uh, um, uh, S3 origin for each of the pages what you define, which can carry with its own pipeline to have that implemented itself. And all you manage is the routers in the Lambda edge, which forwards the request to the respective S3 origin, it depends on the page request itself. Yeah, so the uh, cloud trial, which we are, uh, we, have, we are pretty much working on creating a wrapper layer for all of our uh, you know, communication channel integration, so to deliver the alerts to Slack for any, any instant communication channel itself. So that concludes my presentation, Q&A. Sorry? You mentioned there is some secure data in S3, right? Yeah, yeah. What motivates you? Uh, actually, in a way that, uh, so uh, not all of our, uh, okay, whatever the SP, the web pages we present is more of an anonymous data, which we don't care about it, but uh, whereas the more of our access logs. So whatever the access logs, it pretty much captures the client IP address, so where the request is getting originated from. So, uh, well, again, so you can still don't need, uh, you, you still don't, uh, have to implement this KMS or the data at rest on the S3 itself, but we, from a security sensitive organization, we make sure, like, you know, whatever the sensitive information what we feel, we encrypt the data at rest. This is static data, this is static website, right? Yes, it is a static website, yes, yes. It's more of the access logs we encrypt here. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, it's. Uh, it's with the web components. Yeah. HTML5 web components. Yep. So if there are no further questions, then we'll conclude now.